I did that the previous times too. I uh, found one or two people to help me setting a project up. Because before you can even be public, you have to make like documentation or subsidy requests, set up a website, uh, develop concept art, uh, looking at the topic, like, is this feasible, should we expand it, or how to do it. And those people typically are also the core concept makers. So originally I invited David for concept art. He was a candidate for the previous project for Peach. Uh, Don called me because he has already my address about this, uh, this old Peach project as a spare artist. And he was just saying me that he was looking for some people to make the Durian core team. Uh, and so I was Don, me and Giuseppe Canino, uh, a nice Italian artist. Uh, and uh, Giuseppe couldn't uh, go into Durian because of his job. So Don uh, say, okay, I will take uh, one that is on my spare list. And it was Colin. Yep, I was obviously really intrigued and interested and was like, yes, yeah, of course, I'm interested and um, tell me all about it. And Ton already had this vision for what the project should be and already had an idea of what he wanted and uh, we had technical targets and also um, a, a basic genre. The fantasy movie come very naturally because of the nature of my portfolio. At the end, we was just knowing something before all the team come. It would be a movie with a girl and a dragon that, that was just a, and a warrior girl. But basically beyond that, nothing was set. Um, Tan was going to get a, a, a writer. We, uh, he was interested in, in getting Martin Ludwig uh, involved in the project. Um, he has a real reputation and uh, Tom is really excited to work with them and, and um, I was too, definitely. So that was the start, Colin, David. I combined it with uh, Martin, uh, work a little bit on scripts, do a public call, and then we got 150 people applying, which was far too many. Uh, entries were trickling in first few weeks and then like the last few days it was <laughs> the, the, uh, a deluge. We spent one month and a half to uh, do a, a review of all the portfolio uh, and taking a lot of time with Stone on IRC uh, on a, a channel with Colin just to say uh, which one we like. We make a rating system with a big table with all the artists. It's still really hard to, to select. Uh, so we had 24 people on the shortlist. And even if you look back, it could have been easily 30 or 40 people. So we're all good. And then even from the 24, we only had to pick like four. I'm good at that in. Maybe we can add one or two still. But who? Yeah, Making the switch to Blender 2.5 full-time is taking a fair bit of getting used to. Um, partially because of the bugs and certain things aren't finished, but partially because um, I'm just very used to the older interface. We're kind of uh, getting all the frustration, um, you know, working in a production with tools that are still growing. The first couple weeks uh, were <laughs> uh, pretty difficult. Uh, and that's that's kind of scary because we have, uh, I mean, the developers are working really, really, really hard, uh, but there's only so many of them, and each of them only has so much time. When we started off, there was quite simple things were missing from Blender, um, things you'd expect, just buttons that artists were used to having there. Uh, so that was that was a problem, but we we fairly quickly added them in, and. Uh, yeah, as the artists needed them, they didn't need everything at once, which was nice, so we kind of got the basics working and then later on um, added more advanced things as, as the artists used them. So, yeah, it's worked out better than I expected. I was quite, quite worried at the start because there was whole areas that were just missing and, you know, things don't magically get added back. You have to spend a lot of time sometimes to, to really get them, get them working. But, yeah, it's been, it's been all right. Campbell and I have, have, uh, have roughly same role. The, the, the difference is that he focuses more on um, 
working more closely with the artists, uh, solving day-to-day -day problems, while I focus more on long-term uh, features, bigger features that might take a few weeks to complete. Oh my goodness. God. It's incredible. Campbell! <laughs> Campbell has added copy and paste. That's horrible. But awesome. Well, starting off with the artists, some of them hadn't really worked in this kind of environment before. Um, they hadn't worked with developers even. They'd worked at studios and there was no option to change the software. So even though Blender was quite brought down to being quite basic, some, some of the artists didn't ask for things to be fixed. Um, and we had to kind of tell them, you have to complain when things don't work. And they got the message pretty quick and they started complaining and asking for things to be added. When you're working on, on a feature or, or something in Blender, there's always an interaction with the community. That's just the way uh, the, the, the project is structured. Um, within the Durian project, I'm not so much influenced by what, what the community wants. Uh, what I do is, is based on what, what the artists here uh, want. Of course, I still interact with the community about, about bugs in the features I develop or, or uh, getting it to build on different platforms and things like that. But uh, I guess in a project like this, there's less community, there's a bit less interaction with the community than, than usually. Uh, because of course I, I have, I, I get immediate feedback here. I don't really need to go uh, to the community to, to, uh, to get feedback. Then it was a lot of back and forth between developers and artists. But at the moment, um, everything works kind of fine. And when actually going back to 2.4, it feels like being in Stone Age. As an artist, it's quite cool to have uh, a genuine say on, um, you know, various tools or how they could be tweaked. Um, and th there's not time for every request we'd, we'd like to have, but uh, it's certainly more than you'd get with commercial software, just waiting for the next six months and then paying for a release that may or may not have what you want in it. I've gone back to Blender 2.4 nine a couple of times just to kind of play around with or check to see if uh, something is different or the same uh, or to kind of reference something um, and it just feels so clunky to use every day when you get in you double click the SV SVN update logo on the, on the desktop and suddenly you have a new version of blender that was compiled you know right there on your computer uh, that has everything the most recent um, and the things that Breck and Campbell have been working on are there. Uh, I, I'm really liking the, how everything's more real-time and I can animate while changing keys and it's just very, uh, very smooth to work with. So I think that's one of the main things I'm happy about. And yeah, in general, I'm ecstatic to use 2.5. No story, maximum impact, uh, whatever 16 year olds like to make. Monsters, fighting, uh, just a lot of special effects, explosions, 5,000 warriors going down a hill and fighting. No story, maximum impact. I was oblivious to this. Uh, I really care about having a, a solid story to tell. Um, but at the same time, you can do that with a lot of action. Um, but it's, it's, it does affect the tone of the film. And I think from the outset, everyone uh, sort of has a different conception of, of the project. I hoped it to be sci-fi, but... Well. I saw Durian as a bit more darker, more epic. Uh, dark, slightly disturbed. <laughs> uh, Colin really insisted on getting also a, a, a nice story. Uh, more attention for the script, which was in the end really good because it helped us uh, getting funding from the film fund, for example. I care about the story, so I can only really get behind uh, and direct a film that I really understand and that I really like. You know, uh, Martin has a very interesting uh, style that really works for I think comics better than it works for film, and it's one that lacks structure. The, the work he was presenting us, um, I, I didn't feel like I could direct, um, which is the main issue. It's, it's, it would be a film that I'd be interested to see, uh, but not something that I can really get behind myself. Martin couldn't really help us with this. He didn't have time to do this also, but 
mostly he didn't really even like Diablo. So why would you motivate a character? And that's, of course, if you are a 70 year old grandmaster of the Dutch comic, you can say that, right? But for a 20 year old beginning filmmaker, you would love to do it more in traditional ways, like with the character motivation, exposure, and then setting the conflict, and then having a quest and a resolution at the end. Those traditional things are good to hold on for, for a film project. So then, uh, that is how Esther got in. There were some ideas already, you know, um, plot-wise, and uh, I kind of picked the most interesting one and then brought it out from there. And there were some details in the arena and the setting that uh, came from Martin and uh, that we could use very well. I'm, I really prefer to work uh, collaboratively, especially when, when um, uh, developing uh, screenwriting ideas. Um, the writing I've done by myself is always more painstaking. And it's like you have to have these conversations in your own mind uh, to get anywhere and it's much much more productive if you can just speak and bat ideas around with, with a real person. It turned out that we, uh, we turned out to have lots of the same ideas uh, and we, we could very quickly go backwards and forwards with our ideas and we worked with uh, David's storyboard with David's uh, drawings as well and just uh, brainstormed on that and then I would go home and, uh, and uh, write it out and then bounce it backwards and forwards with Colin and you know add some ideas. It was Esther that was giving a new draft of uh, the, the story and us with just a comment and give feedback. And if the feedback was pertinent or no, she was doing the modification or not. It's, uh, so this is the process of the last uh, few months, I think. I guess compa comparing the two projects, like Big Buck Bunny, I think we had the story much earlier on. Uh, and we had storyboards much earlier on. Uh, with Durian, it's been kind of a, a bit of a struggle uh, to get the final story and the final storyboards. So that's that slowed things down a bit. It's taken us almost six months, I think, from the very beginning to now, to have a script that we've all, that's locked, bam. We have, we have a final script. Yeah. 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 Where is the champagne? Okay. <laughs> take well, it out, take it I, out. I take that back, actually, because Esther <laughs> <laughs> is working on the final polish which she said that she would mail today. So anyway, we're, we're basically there. Though it still has taken a little while to get to the point where the story is set, um, I think it's been worth it because this story is really good and just getting the film fund uh, funding is a really good indication that we've, we've got something. Elephant's Dream was proof that we can actually make it make something that looks like as if it's professional, huh? almost a real animation film, wow, huh? it was far more, it was really a technical demo, of course with great creativity and wonderful shots and characters in it, but the emphasis was mostly on the making itself. Uh, Big Bird Bunny was already more uh, a film with a more uh, the sophisticated story writing and uh, storyboarding time. The great storyboarders and the team, so we could do a lot of work on that. So, for Dury, the target is like a, a film which is perceived as a film and not as a technical demo. So, you can sit down, watch it, and enjoy the little story which is being told with computer graphics. Yeah. Scales! There is one drawing that got uh, a lot of impact. It was a little girl with a tiny dragon. And I did it during the first meeting with Esther Vuda. And she totally fell in love for this little drawing and she, she started to work on this baby dragon idea. But this baby dragon idea was an original idea of Colin. Uh, it was a revision for, from a Martin script. Now, this idea really 
appealed to me. I could immediately see it. I could immediately, you know, see this whole film in front of my eyes. And at the same time, I, I, I knew that if I start off this story with a baby dragon and a girl who gets attached to this as if it's her pet, I just knew, you know, it had to end badly because in the end, I just knew that the baby dragon had to go and that, of course, it had to be a tragedy. Life is about finding things and then having to let them go again and, uh, you know, loving something, but uh, after a few years it falls apart, you know, and then something new comes your way. So it had different layers, the story, and I think that's what makes it nice. I wanted to end this film with a woman, you know, who has grown and is sadder but wiser and maybe has shed lots of old things of her past and maybe old grief and everything. And so that would be more of a, an empty landscape. So that is actually why we started off with a very crowded space. And the idea of the slum was interesting. And that is how we, how we started off with the city of Ishtar, where she starts. This Ishtar city that is uh, built on like a Babylonian world. And after there is like a medieval layer on it. And after I have like a religious war on it. So there is a mix of something that is very mystical from the base and after something that is uh, more like uh, a story about ecology too, because this city of Ishtar is a city very pollu polluted. So this is a part I, I really wanted to have it. And because on the script we got that this Ishtar city is a slum, that was a, a beautiful door open to this and we got the temple in Ishtar, the Ziggurat temple. It was a beautiful uh, way, again, to have some, add some mystical element in the Ishtar city. Going from David's concepts into some sort of design of the city is um, looking at lots of reference and then looking at things that I like, maybe pick one feature there, one feature from that image and others from other images and then putting them together, um, altering them, and that's kind of like the workflow. And it takes some time because you have to figure it out yourself a bit. But uh, it's a lot of fun, and I finally understood uh, why it is good to have some sort of library in your mind, like for things like uh, crates, just knowing how different crates look, just knowing how different uh, grunge stuff on walls look, and stuff like that. Working with David on the details of the, the city was and is very nice because he's very uh, open to suggest suggestions and he is very quick in his concepts and it's very nice, very high quality and you can derive a lot of from it. Working with Ben is pretty cool also because uh, well, we can uh, communicate very nicely and he's very open also. Don't tries to push his ideas too hard and I don't try to push my ideas too hard so it's back and forth between us and everyone gives some input into the process of creating things and it's very nice, I learn a lot from him. He's very experienced and uh, I get very nice things and ideas from him, yeah, it's very cool. As far as constructing the market scene, uh, the main issue seemed to be that we had a certain amount of time to build a large amount of stuff and the, the layout for the scene, um, Colin had blocked in what he wanted, but um, then he went on holidays and we weren't exactly sure what he might want to change. So in order to try and keep flexibility, I just started building a, a bit of a library of, say, um, you know, crates, barrels, tables, uh, produce and that. But I'm still not 100% sure whether that was the best way to approach the market because it, it would have been nice to have shots 100% locked off and then detail those up. Um, but for what we had, I think that the library give, gave enough flexibility to get it done. The other environments beside the city will be very easy compared to it, yeah. Not only because of the um, things that uh, needs to be created for those environments, but also because I create, or by the process of creating the city, I get an idea of uh, what I will going for, what I want to go for, and uh, how I achieve that. Yeah, so it will be much easier.
I, I think the fact we started with the city was just a very tough thing to do because that's where most of the detail is. So not to say that the, the cave or any of the other environments are excessively simple, but it, they, they should be easier to get done in a regular time frame and then build on if we have time, um, just because they're, they're not quite as complex in the range of stuff you need to have there to make it work. There's still a lot to do and there's still a lot I need to personally work out and then work out with the team as far as workflow goes to make sure it does work as a film. But um, I, I'm not as stressed about the rest of the film as I was about the city. Style, style. Hey. I haven't considered style. Yes, yeah, because for a movie I think it's good if we choose a style before doing the movie. Probably. Yeah. Probably a good, smart idea. I guess an ongoing discussion that Dave and I have had from the very beginning is, is what is the style of this film? Um, we have a certain kind of story, and the performances uh, need to be pretty solid um, to really uh, pull it off correctly. And, and so much of the performance just has to do with the design of the characters. For both Sintel and the Shaman, um, we went through numerous iterations. The shaman design is interesting because uh, basically in the script we got only there is a shaman and that's all. So just the word shaman in capital and behind this idea of shaman we can have so many concepts. It's uh, what is a shaman, a marabou, a magical man, a fatherly figure. Sintel is very strong and she has learned a lot and she's become very strong but at the same time she has a certain blindness and there has to be someone who gives her at least a hint of an idea that she has to open her eyes and really look, you know, look with her heart or, you know, uh, be more alert, not with, you know, strength, with physical strength, but with, uh, with her heart, I suppose. And uh, that is why we created this role of the, sh of the shaman. David can visualize anything. He's like extremely good at, uh, you know, if you if you give him a direction, he can go he can go nuts. But he needs that direction. We we didn't got some background, so the the work I did was to show to the team a, a very provocative picture of where we can go. Okay, behind this world, shaman, this design can still fit. The, the forearm thing uh, is just a little bit strong, I think, and it maybe softens the, the other designs. It changes the idea of what the world is, the world of this film. The shaman is, is really sort of a character that comes with some baggage. It's, it's like a, it's a, it is a cliche. Um, in the hero's journey, at some point you come to a mentor and have this figure who, who gives you advice or gives you a warning. Um, so that's the role that he plays in this film, and he looks like um, like a more traditional sort of idea of what, what that character would be. Um, but on the other hand, it's really, it works, it works well. What are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know who's going to make it. I'm going to animate. Wow, <laughs> look at that smile. Woo! Yeah. Nothing but animating. This project has a lot more work, I think. It's um, uh, a lot of characters. Um, Nathan and uh, Colin will join in, but right now it's just me, um, just me animating. Uh, I've been doing some experimentation for some new stuff and we'll see how that, that turns out. Um, I can't speak for the other people who have other responsibilities, at least in terms of rigging and animation, I think. Most of the features from 2.4 that we need, we already have. Now we've got an idea of the story and what it means to the characters in the story. So I think we have an idea of each sequence, uh, what a character is feeling, how they're going to um, uh, appear uh, in terms of their emotions that they project. Uh, that's all down and uh, I'm feeling really good with that. Basically I've been coming up with a shot now that we've just started animating finals and I'll say, what do you think of this blocking? Uh, we don't even have facial animation at this point, but uh, Colin would just say, yep, yep, that's cool, go for it. And we seem to be understanding each other on uh, what the character's meant to be feeling. So that's going really smoothly. I don't know if that idea works though, until I see it together. 
Um, I'll work with Colin a little bit on that, how we'll tie it into the next scene. I'm quite happy to, to just be animating and um, take, take that away from the team's plate a bit. Nathan. Team Nathan is part of team animation, but he's also part of Team Nathan, which is cloth sim. Yeah, the, the cloth sim is interesting because we're, we're going to have to use it pretty heavily in this project. Uh, but getting it to a level where it's ready for production uh, is, uh, is not a minor uh, task, I don't think. For example, being able to uh, kind of control it in weird ways when we might need to, to solve animation problems uh, and tweak it to how we want it to look, uh, even if it's not accurate, uh, things like that. Bandaging is also good because we need to figure out the cloth sim, and that'll be a really killer test case. <laughs> Can we wrap cloth around the dragon's wing? <laughs> and so trying to get everything that we need uh, in time for us to get, get the things in the project done that we need done uh, at the times that we need them uh, is, is proving to be a little bit tricky. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Fighting scenes are still yet to be sorted out. We are going to see our great kung fu expert and go over all the choreography uh, and then we'll begin animating. But already we had a quick discussion with him uh, one evening and we were straight away on the same page. In fact, he was suggesting things that our initial choreography hadn't picked up on or um, you know, things we didn't realise. So I think it's going to be very exciting. We're just going to film as much as we can. And um, yeah, I think it's going to bring a lot to it. Um, what they'll create in the real world, we'll be able to then take and uh, just exaggerate it with animation. So we should be able to keep the, the, uh, the truth of what they've created, which I think will be very powerful. I, I think he has a lot of ideas of how to actually stage it and film it. So he'll be working a lot with Colin, I imagine, and I'll be able to just sit back and go, okay, this is good. I'll, I'll wait until all the video comes back and we've got a rundown of each shot and then I'll just take it from there. I, I think I'll just be working out the, um, the small details of the animation. Uh, I think they're going to create something fantastic. Check it out. The man has interior and exterior, the back alley, then there's a barren landscape, a bamboo landscape, a fog and rocky landscape, a desert, and a windy landscape. And then at the top of the mountain, there is a volcano on the launch cave, a layer. But it's a lot of The city is quite <laughs> Maybe the, the Durian team act like, uh, mm, uh, like blind people. Uh, that must do this to, to find a way. You did press F12 in the past days. Or did you? Mm. Why don't you save F12s? Why don't you show that to people? Very few people understand rigging uh, on this team to the, to the degree that I do. Um, certainly that's the case of Tan, not, not to be, you know, uh, means Tan, I mean, it's just, you know, different people have different skill sets. And so, you know, if I, say it's going to take me this long to rig something, or if it's going to be this difficult, or this isn't really possible. I mean, he just has to kind of listen to me. <laughs> uh, whereas that's not so much the case with the, the render guys and, and the animation guys. What is the target? What are you going to show Friday? Uh, the finished thing of three shots of that thing. <laughs> Including textures. Yeah, of course, finished. Final, 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 final. Mm -hmm. At the level that you say, I can put this in the film without getting ashamed. I think uh, Colin's right in saying that lighting and rendering, uh, compositing will add a lot to the atmosphere. If you have something, it's final, and then improve it. Improve it, improve it. So, and not say, uh, sorry, we don't have anything yet, but to compose it and solve it. That's not working. The limitation of time seems to be more prevalent than the limitation of choice. So, you know, I might want to push a certain environment, you know, in a certain direction or whatever, but it comes down to whatever I can come up with at the end of two weeks. Starting tomorrow, we have to stop working on the city. This is it. That's a big problem. 
I mean, I know I've seen progress, but of course the purpose is even to finish the project. So the freedom as an artist might come back down to what's the quickest way to do this scene. You are supposed to do it or something and you're doing it. Right? You can't use this. And I mean, you can still sort of have some choice over how you get that done. But um, yeah, there's not particularly the time on a lot of different tasks to express yourself to the fullest extent you'd like to. Getting all the stuff together is halfway. And then you start actually making it. It's a lot of work that I've done. I want to have a final picture. I want you to look at the big picture, fix everything. I say, okay, this is maybe 40 or 50 percent, but this is how the film could look like. And now we're going to make it a bit better and a bit better and a bit better. Uh, we can still screw out the movie, but uh, I'm confident that we will figure everything out and then the movie will just look awesome. Yeah. But you have to prove that that's true and you failed on that. That's the point. And I've seen that fail all the time. The stuff you showed to me didn't resemble to me anything to the final film. At all. It, I saw a loose element. I ignore it. I ignore the stress. So simply as that. Yeah. I actually don't feel it to be very, very stressful because it's fun and it's working in a team and the team is nice and so it's okay. Working on it is just nice enough, so it doesn't feel like stress. Yeah. I think you have really both stubborn hearts and you want to do it your way. But you have to get over that. We're not hearing from you guys what you can do. But I want to help you. I want to help you realize this film and not be mad at you because you don't do it. If you cannot, then you cannot. That's fine. Then you do it differently. Right? So, what can we do? Tell me what you will do. I write it down and in two weeks we will see it. If you can't handle that, then we have to reduce the complexity, the complexity of the work or so. That's not fun for you guys. Too much then. Too complicated. Too ambitious. A lot. I think you have probably some nice audits from me during the weekly. Like, what is in your mind? Like, uh, what do you think? It's like, I try to figure out what, how people work. So sometimes a little bit playful, trying to get them angry or like, okay, so what is this? Because we have to become a team. And everybody was too relaxed, like, ah, oh, it's going to be fun. And I have, uh, I'm doing my thing, he's doing his thing, and together somehow a film will pop out of it. And that's not really true. You have to work together on doing it. Yeah, it was very, I mean, it was very stressful. Um, but I also, I, Especially in retrospect, I definitely see where Tan was coming from. I was trying to measure the productivity of people. And it was not predictable. Like, give people an assignment and then find out how long they take to do it. Whatever you do, you ask 100%, you get 70, 80. But now it was more like you only got like 20 or 30%. It's really far too complicated, too much, right? to make it smaller, 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 to find out, okay, but what is this thing where you can feel people being confident that they can do it? It was on a different level than what I thought. It's very hard to keep, um, keep an eye out on, on what's important uh, for, the, for the film. Tan has said, you know, I should be the one worrying about quality, and he just wants to have the film done. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, obviously, it, it introduces some tension. The producer on the one side is thinking about the practicalities of getting it done and getting it done well, and the director is thinking about the the finished uh, film from like a story standpoint, and is pushing for all these other things. He didn't realize that it, that we're doing nine minutes now. I thought we were still going six to seven minutes. Nine minutes. A lot of animation. Well, it's, the, it's the stupid story. I have a great story, but the stupid thing is 
you have to tell a story, what takes time. For example, the old ziggurat scene was, I think, a couple of shots. Sintel running up, Sintel saying, ah, excited, big dragon coming in and grabbing the, the baby away. And now it's at least 25 or 30 shots almost. I think the scene is wonderful, it really works perfect. You don't think it takes that much time, but uh, it is, and you have to make it. In average, I you still say that the character second is half a day? Uh, no, I think this would be more like a second a day. I also have to shoulder a lot of the responsibility for adding a lot of these, these seconds. I just kind of freaked out because I was like, there's no way we can do this with this number of people because it's just, just way too much. At which time, I thought more people were needed uh, from the beginning. The probability is that we have one sheet full time. If you see the, the schedule of this line is the Jean Sebastian line. And Jean Sebastian will do Sigurat and City stuff to start with. And probably later he will do the whole cave. That's the idea. But uh, unfortunately, he had to go back for his, uh, his shop. Seems like seems like it'd be cool. Making movies was just really easy. Why don't we ask Todd to make it easier? It's a really good idea. He's not the one who decided on the story. <laughs> My fault. We can we can scrap half the film if we can find a way to make it work. So we need more people. We need more people. I agree. It's impossible. <laughs> that would be so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All we have to is do half the film. Yeah, we could. It was more like, uh, are we going to cut the film, or can we add people to the team? There was always the three moments for financing. Like we knew, okay, with Blender only we can make a small project. With film fund money we can double it, and with uh, money for the from Cinequit for the, the 4K version, we can add another few people or a couple of months. And in February, I had signals that the 4K money would be nearly certain. We didn't know for sure, but uh, we have to, to balance it out. Tan has done everything that he, he, he could to, to make the film that we're trying to make happen. And it's meant, um, I think, a strain on, on resources, but he's pulled a lot uh, together and basically expanded the team um, by a factor of two, um, and that's uh, been a huge, huge relief. I mean, I could animate it myself, but it wouldn't have been up to the quality or standard that we wanted on this project. So I was very happy that we got in some more guys. The addition of extra artists um, was very, I guess, welcome surprise is the way to put it. We got more people, but now the film is about 12 minutes. It's somehow expanded since then. It just felt like everything was happening fast. 12 minutes, come on, it's impossible. Eight, nine, you know? It's, it's just a process of sort of figuring out what, what this movie is, that we're, we're going to, what this project, uh, what we want from it. That's the only thing I really care about is making sure that, that the final product is worth all the effort that we're putting into it. When I came over, I was really surprised to see how chaotic it really was. Everything was behind. Yeah, it, I was kind of thinking they'd be a little bit further on. You know, where, where this is going to be a struggle. <laughs> it was really like, what? are we that far from? <laughs> it was really only just starting. It seemed, even though it had been going for a while, the, the story was really just settling and a lot of things still hadn't been laid out. Very little was done, very little was finished, um, and enormous amounts of work was 
was still incomplete and needed to be done. So uh, my first reaction was just, wow, I mean, there's really a lot of work here needs, needing to be done. So uh, it's a bit scary, really. Yeah. There were no renders on the animatic. You, you know the animatic, the editing of the whole movie. There were no renders. There was open shell renders and uh, drawings even in some parts. So I started to panic. <laughs> but also just the workflow, figure out the workflow. I had been using Blender 2.5, so I knew a bit about it, but there was still a lot I had to learn. Well, getting into a, a project that is already started is always a bit uh, difficult. Uh, but for some reason here, I, I felt really welcome. It's, uh, I don't know, the, the, I got the feeling that I already knew them. It's always difficult to come into a team from the outside. So it takes a couple of weeks even to just find sort of who you're dealing with, what can I do. I'm in the render team, I'm a compositor now here for Jurian, but it's not my specialty from before. So a lot of the time I have to go like, help, what do, how do I fix this? Or I have to ask Ben about textures, which he's really good at, or ask Sunka about lighting Sintel, which he knows everything about. So without their help, I couldn't be doing this. Yeah, it takes a little while here and there to get them up to speed on um, what we've been doing before they got here. But generally speaking, people have been able to slot in fairly well. Having uh, the team just expand the way it did brings a whole, uh, it feels like the dynamic has changed um, enormously. And, it, uh, and the challenges too that, that, uh, that I personally face are, have changed as well. Now the animation team consists of four people. And so within the team, even though it's still pretty small, uh, the, the sort of mini teams, subgroups start to form. Everyone's got an opinion and everyone throws around their opinions, but at some point when there's a difference of opinions, you need to have someone who's a circuit breaker. So we started doing animation dailies and, uh, and that's been very helpful. But we always make sure that whatever Colin wants goes. So if there's a difference of opinion, it's up to Colin. It's really the role of the director, of Colin, to come in, look at what we're doing, and then say, okay, but you need to do this, make it a bit more flat, the lighting, make it more pronounced. And it's really Colin's role to make it all one thing. Someone has to basically get up and take responsibility for something and make it happen. And it doesn't always happen, and the team is getting a bit too big for that, in a way. Don said, how would you feel if you're the, the lighting director or lighting Blah blah designer. I don't know. There, I don't know if there's even a name for that. Lighting dude. We started talking about this lighting director thing with the team. They agreed, and uh, I had to agree to. <laughs> At first, I didn't feel that that right about having to go and kick guys. Like a, I don't want him to to hate me. I mean, <laughs> it didn't feel right. But uh, I think. We all, uh, we're all learning here, so. I sort of feel like the team we have now is, is, is the team that we all always should have had, or the, the team we should have started with, or, or we feel now like we're a, a working unit. That's really a team now, and they're very focused, very concentrated. And it just takes time. It's ridiculous. But it did help to get more people on the team with the skills and the experience. And that inspires others too to be faster and more decisive. They see, hey, so you can do it in a week. Then I will try too. I, I think everyone is just working better now, now that we have, um, you know, the resources, the people, um, and the personalities that we need to, to get the film done. Uh, with so many artists who need all, all different things and then shifting the focus all the time, trying to you know, work on a big feature but while still being this, you know, disturbed for doing like small bug fixes. So it's sort of, I think the most challenging is just like the multitasking. Each artist had different expectations of what, of what the software should do and how it should work. And we would find sort of whole areas of Blender that didn't work properly just because we hadn't used them before, and we didn't think it was important for, for the project, at least. Also, the movie got longer, so we got more, just, there's just more problems. So it's just, 
we've just gotten more things to do as, <laughs> as the project went along. So, um, I mean, if I had known this in advance, I would have done less uh, like ambitious development targets. Um, I mean, it already basically it already happened. I mean, we already had to like the physics simulation. We already had to push it back, and then it's not going to be as good as it could be, just because there was no time for it, and there's just more uh, more stuff to do. So I know enough to know that I don't want to work on hair. It's extremely complicated, at least to do in a short time and and to do in a production environment. Like uh, I'm sure you could in develop some sort of hair simulation that looks nice in a controlled environment, but if you just give um, you know all sorts of problems to it, like someone lying down, the hair colliding in odd ways, it's, it just seems very error prone and very difficult to get it working right. So I haven't really been, I haven't been working on the, the solver, we call it. Um, I've, I've left that to, to, to Brecht. Uh, I think we underestimated the problem uh, and we should have probably prioritized uh, on it earlier. But there's, I mean, the hair, hair, there's different problems. Rendering it is difficult. I mean, it's notoriously difficult in computer graphics to hand to hair, to light hair, but in Blender, of course, we don't, it's not particularly good. So in, in the lighting department, we already, uh, we struggled a lot to get it looking right. Um, and then there's hair simulation uh, for moving hair. Um, it's just we didn't have enough time to do it and then we had to scramble to try to get something working anyway. But then if you do a quick solution, it, you know, it might not actually work well. So you have to spend time on it anyway. And so it's, it's just been, ideally what we should have done is really uh, like taken the time to, to write a good hair simulator um, and, and test it in various cases. But now, basically all we can do is just try to, to patch it up uh, and try to get it working for us. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, if we cannot make a trailer, we also cannot make a film. And if we cannot make a film, we also don't have a trailer. <laughs> the trailer was of course very frustrating for everybody. It was really good that we did it. Perfect, really good. I really still, I remember the week when we Tom started talking about the trailer and we, we want it because we want to go to SIGGRAPH and show everybody. And he was like, okay, how much time do we need? And I had the feeling like, oh, we can do it in a week. And I felt it. If you say today, we need it next Monday, we can have it next Monday. If you say today, uh, yeah, we want it next Monday, but Eh, maybe, I don't know, we need all these problems, then you won't have it next Monday, if you do it half-half. And I still kind of feel like if we did it the right way, we could have done it in that first week. And I think it took us a month. It's like the first thing where we have a, a goal, we've set a deadline for ourselves, although we missed the deadline, uh, and we, we felt like it was doable. And those shots have to be finished. And as soon as they are ended, we just put them in the trailer. In many ways, the team started to get very frustrated and its inability to be able to finish things, get things out on time. It's actually since the trailer that, you know, the render farm's been really kicking in and, and the, all the shots are improving. That's when everyone's spirits have lifted. It's, it was uh, huge. It was like, wow, we're, we're actually making a movie here. Releasing the trailer and hearing people's feedback gave me permission to feel good about what I was doing again. Whereas the film, it's always this sort of mass that's a little bit undefined and uh, amorphous and, um, and just a huge sort of burden on, our, on, on everyone's shoulders that you know, is always in the future. The trailer was something immediate. And also gave us a lot of feedback. So and after a while, we started getting critique on the trailer. And then we thought, ah, okay, so we're noticing a hundred problems, and but ninety of them are so small that you could see on an average out of like three hundred odd comments. Oh well, the things that the problems that seem to repeat themselves. People that were saying, oh, I noticed the hair, I noticed the hair, I noticed the hair. And we knew that from the beginning. I think in in, in February or March, so we said it in the weekly that we have to get over this. We have to get final pictures. We have to finish the shot completely and then say, and this is it, and that's painful. When we got back the first renders of the, the snow fight scene, um, 
that was just a, such an awesome moment. I, I remember I, I, I walked over to, to Ben's computer and he had these, this render up there and I was just like, that looks so good. I had no idea our movie was gonna look this good. The snow scene, for example, um, I effectively remade it twice, um, but at some point you just gotta take what you have and keep tweaking it because you just can't rebuild it again. <laughs> Yeah, there is a tendency to look at the detail too much, but having said that, I mean, on this project, more than any other probably, because it's so open and everyone gets to open up the files and, and there's a whole community out there that are going to be looking very closely at this movie, I think there's nothing wrong with looking at the details, you know, and I don't mind obsessing over details, you know. Let's have this man smoke. Real life with smoke, puffs coming out of his mouth, and the pipe, that kind of things. And it's nice, great, but it takes a week to do that. Don't have it. And all kinds of little things where you say, well, really like the, the baby dragon should have a bandaging around his wings in the sleeping scene. Cut. And there are many of those little things you have to cut to make sure we, we can still do it. It's probably the, the biggest disappointment uh, is just recognizing that uh, we don't have a lot of time left and we can't take things to the, the level of quality that we, we would like to and know that we could if we had more time. Uh, though I'm not really afraid of being able to finish the animation that we have scheduled, I'm, I'm concerned about having it uh, reach my, my own expectations. You have to be so careful, like, okay, we have to work really, really hard, but you have to pace yourself because you have to survive this somehow. And you can see that different people deal with that in different ways as well. It's just fun. The priority should be, should focus on getting the, the, the characters believable. Hmm. The big priority in the coming six weeks is getting hair. Um, pretty much just getting it done, I think, is the priority. I think, I think we'll make it, but in terms of like how much we can polish. I think we can do a bit. It is a pretty exciting time in the project uh, and definitely I have a lot of confidence now that maybe uh, I wasn't feeling as much um, even a couple months ago. So yeah, pretty excited. It's a pre-premiere. The team has been working really, really, really hard to get this film done. I have to admit, I'm even a bit nervous, <laughs> even though I know it is totally awesome. I mean, you have to keep in mind the film is not finished, but it is like 99% finished. We will tweak some light, there will be some uh, render errors fixed, 
Uh, Jan will do a final mix on things, but the music is there, mostly. The sound editing is there, mostly. <laughs> and the picture is there. So, uh, one more thing. Um, we will put a camera in the corner there, because you are a test audience. That means when you start laughing at the wrong moment, <laughs> you know that there's something wrong with a specific shot. I hope you don't forgive us to use that material. We might even put it if it's really good on the DVD. <laughs> and one other last thing, after all the pirates and people who love to mix uh, pictures of the film, we put it on the web. We are now we are all into freedom and spreading everything. But I would appreciate it if you leave that to us to post it. We have a deal with the Dutch or the Netherlands Film Festival to have a premiere officially in September. This allows us to fix it the next six weeks a little bit in the film to have it totally good. I hope you uh, appreciate this pre-premiere and we talk in one hour to hear what you thought about it. Thank you. So oh, thank you guys, you have been such an awesome team, above you. <laughs>